for deaf victims and their family, we are requesting that the AS ASL interpreter is in all frames for language access here in Maine and the U.S. They are grieving and have a right to know the latest info in ASL. You can see we've changed this a, a little bit, the kind of the setup from earlier today. Uh, and again, as we continue to evolve, right, lots of podiums, we've got to lost our maps. The whole thing was a little bit of a mess uh, earlier, to be quite honest. And, uh, and our victims in this investigation and the people that are doing the work uh, deserve better than that. So uh, I would also tell you that we're kind of looking for a larger venue as well. Uh, the chains here and everything else seems to work. Uh, we're going to use some technology um, for um, some pictures here uh, right off the bat. So um, I would say that, uh, again, thank you for joining us. It's been a busy day uh, for our law enforcement officers and our partners uh, around the state. Uh, I'm going to give some updates uh, from what we found. But the real primary reason I wanted to bring uh, you back in today uh, was we wanted to really identify the victims um, and uh, show their pictures. Uh, we won't get into uh, family backgrounds and, and um, their lineage at all, but we do want to show uh, those pictures, give uh, ages. I would say that uh, the families didn't want hometowns uh, listed. Uh, they do uh, certainly uh, deserve and want some privacy uh, around these issues, which makes complete sense. Uh, and uh, we're going to start with that uh, component of our information simply because that's why we're here, right? Uh, this is about the victims. Uh, that's why we do what we do, and that's why we're striving so hard, and that's why you're here, uh, because you care about them as well. So uh, we're going to go ahead and load that um, behind us here on the screen. And I think uh, Shannon Moss can also put that information out uh, following this. Some specifics here, uh, I would just like to note that the families actually uh, approved these photos, uh, sent these photos in to us. Uh, for a lot of different reasons. I think some of them show uh, a little of their character, a little of their relationships, uh, and uh, some other specifics. You'll just see again a picture, a name, uh, an age, and then there's a couple symbols there. And we wanted to be specific enough to, to what location uh, they ultimately uh, lost their lives at. Um, and again, thank the families for allowing us to even do this. They certainly didn't need to do that. Um, they're working through their own um, struggles. Uh, and rightfully so. So I'm going to start with this and then uh, ask for just a, a moment of silence before we continue on uh, to our next uh, agenda item. Uh, but that uh, top left, as you see it, and that is Ronald G. Morin, 55. And I won't read uh, the venues. You can, uh, you can put that all together yourself. Uh, Peyton Brewer Ross, 40 years of age. Joshua A. Seal, 36 years of age. Brian M. McFarlane, 41 years of age. Joseph Lawrence Walker, 57. Arthur Fred Strout, 42. Max A. Hathaway, 35. Stephen M. Vuzella, 45. Thomas Ryan Conrad, 34. Michael R. Deloria, the second, 51. Jason Adam Walker, 51. Tricia C. Asselin, 53. William A. Young, 44. Aaron Young, 14, his son. Robert E. Violet, 76, and his wife, Lucille M. Violet, 73. William Frank Brackett, 48 years of age. Keith D. McNair, 64. Just have a moment of silence, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, truly, truly appreciate it. And we do, again, uh, appreciate that to the family. Um, they did give us those photos. I did not, however, um, 
have any of the family members pronounce any of those last names, so certainly no disrespect intended if uh, in any way uh, screwed up the pronunciation. So to move on, uh, I would also like to address the numbers of the victims that, we, uh, that I confirmed earlier today with uh, the number eight. Uh, and I will tell you that's miscommunication on my part. I was wrong. Um, in talking to our detectives, uh, we had uh, a list for people that had been identified and family members that had been notified. It's also a separate list that involved uh, family advocacy and whether or not they had been plugged into that. So the reality here is that all 18 of those victims, everybody that we listed here today, everybody has been identified and their families have been notified. So we are in contact with them. I would expect some more information uh, later tonight and um, I'll definitely talk about it tomorrow morning at 10, uh, reference to uh, Family Information Center, a new location and some material around that, exactly what services will be available uh, at that particular time. But I definitely wanted to make sure that I correct uh, that mistake uh, from earlier. So several other updates um, from uh, this morning's briefing. I know that uh, Shannon has sent along the aerial maps uh, that we showed uh, or tried to show here on the board, uh, so you have received those. Uh, I also think that we had, uh, and Shannon has corrected this as well, but the Pajebscott boat ramp, the proper name there was the Paper Mills Trail and Miller Park boat launch. The address was correct at 501 Lisbon Street. The jump scott is a little bit further down uh, the river, apparently, and we certainly like uh, and appreciate everybody uh, working with us to make sure that we had the, the proper location, the proper terminology uh, for that. Uh, and other additional uh, updates, the boat launch search uh, of the river, the Androscoggin, they're still out there uh, right now, and they'll be there as long as they can uh, based on the light. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, we're talking about sonars and grid searches and things of that nature. That's time intensive. It's taken them a while to work through there. They want to make sure they do it right. Um, so we're not going to finish that search this evening. I would be surprised if you ever saw divers in the water overall. Uh, but tomorrow, we'll have additional dive resources available to us uh, from out of state as well as some additional in-state teams. Um, so again, we'll discuss that a little bit at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, but no surprises. We expect that to go over and uh, that we'll have some assets there tomorrow. They did a bunch of flyovers this morning, as I mentioned. They did the sonar searches, some side, some ROV, um, and uh, we'll be back on that tomorrow. The, the bar scene itself, um, they continue to do uh, their uh, on-scene investigation there, as well as at the bowling alley. Uh, they did check those wood lines. Uh, they may be back in there tomorrow as well, uh, but that is progressing as expected. And I think uh, another major piece uh, of updates uh, for you uh, now is to talk about the shelter in place order and where that's going uh, effective immediately. Uh, and I'm, I'm not a big reader of orders, but I think this is important that you hear this directly from um, a couple different sources. We're gonna put out a release. There's gonna be a cell phone uh, geofence release to some folks. Uh, we've used that a couple times already. Uh, during the active shooter as a warning and otherwise. But the shelter in place order is rescinded, except hunting is prohibited in the towns of Lewiston, Lisbon, Bowdoin, and Monmouth, beginning Saturday, 10 28 24, until further notice. The state police continue to search in Lewiston, Lisbon, Bowdoin, and Monmouth for the suspect, Robert Card, and recommend individuals remain vigilant. Businesses may choose to open or remain closed. Uh, Commissioner Camuso from IFNW is here to help us answer any additional questions about that hunting piece. Um, it was asked this morning, uh, and it was a good question, and I told you at that time that we were working on an answer for that. Uh, and what that means is that uh, the general shelter in place has been rescinded, specifically hunting, again, is prohibited in those four towns and those four towns only. And it's important that I mention that because the rest of the state is allowed to continue with their resident only day uh, on Saturday, tomorrow. And what does that mean? That means that there are going to be communities that hear gunshots from time to time because they're going to be hunting. Um, so we would ask everybody to use caution in that and not think that every one of those gunshots is directly uh, regarding this particular crisis situation, this investigation. So clearly, if they think 
If they're suspicious, if they're concerned, they can certainly call their local agencies. But I would ask them to think about that, where they're located, um, when do they hear that, if they're 150 miles north, do they need to call their 911 center and, and create a response? Um, and I think I would say no to that, unless they have another set of facts, a fact pattern that would believe them that there's a direct connection between that gunfire and what they've heard uh, to this point. So we had mentioned why we made that decision initially, because of the crisis and the situation that we had. Uh, those four towns in, in particular, clearly with Lewiston uh, and the two uh, tragic situations here, the two locations we've already talked about. Uh, and then you have Lisbon, Lisbon with the boat launch, Bowdoin where the suspect live. In Monmouth, there's other family connections in that particular area as well. So this is not to say um, that uh, the crisis is over, the emergency is done, uh, we can go about our lives as life is good. We want our folks, we want our residents to remain vigilant and to pay attention to what we, what we share for information. I again focus on what we share is in the Department of Public Safety in the city of Lewiston uh, because we continue to see a lot of information from a lot of different places uh, that is far from accurate. I would also say in that regard, um, when we say that we're going to meet you here at 10, we're going to meet you here at 10, and when we say we're going to notify you, we are going to notify you in the afternoon if we're going to get together and what time that is. Um, I just encourage you to, to believe that until I prove you wrong. Uh, and I won't. Uh, and I say that because we've heard some other stuff. There's going to be a press conference at 1 o'clock. Um, and then our PIO, who's incredibly busy, gets 100 emails and says, is it going to be 1 o'clock or is it going to be this? Uh, and you've got a job to do. I get it. And we're trying to help you do your job. And if you could help us do our job, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. So that is uh, some of those uh, pieces for updates from what we uh, worked on this morning. A couple of additional things. Um, neighborhood canvases, as an example, I did not speak to that. Uh, so we talked about large um, deployments of officers in various locations. What would that look like? Um, neighborhood canvases could be a couple of officers knocking on a door. And uh, that's going to be happening at various locations uh, around this particular area in multiple towns. Again, if somebody's using their own uh, common sense and they say that doesn't seem right, then sure, call. Uh, but you could have two uniformed officers or two officers with clearly displayed badges jumping out of a marked car to come talk to you as detectives. There was a question this morning around arrival times at the two locations, and we had done some research uh, on that, uh, which was hot off the presses uh, walking out the door to come here today. Uh, so spare time, as we had mentioned earlier, that initial 911 call was uh, occurred at 6.56 p.m. And by the CAD system, or the computer-aided dispatch system, so somebody calls in on a radio and they says, now I'm out at that location. The first officer, the first Lewiston officer arrived based on that system at 7 p.m., so four minutes later. The reality there, however, is that there were four plainclothes police officers that were shooting on the range in that general area. They hear that call come in, and they're walking into the, into the bar, in, or rather the bowling alley, in about a minute and a half. Um, so they don't have radios, they weren't in uniform, they hear it as they're at the range, they respond to the address immediately, and then they address the threat and, and clear the building. For that same location, right, spare time, as an example, you have Lewiston, it's a self-contained police department, they work with everybody, so it's not uncommon to see the main state police in town, but they don't have specific areas to patrol. Calls came in to dispatch centers for the Department of Public Safety that would control uh, the Maine State Police, as an example, at 6.57, so a minute-ish later. And we didn't have necessarily troopers right inside the town, so 11 minutes later our first trooper arrives, which is not uncommon, actually, and that's a pretty good response time, considering it's an urban atmosphere and troopers aren't here. The second set of calls, as we've discussed, came in at 7.08. So this is the bar and grill. And the first Lewiston officer is responding there at 19.13 or 7.13 p.m., so five minutes later. And then, really, it becomes exponential after that, as an example. Um, should have mentioned this earlier, but spare time, uh, a minute after those initial officers respond, eight more are there. Like now we're saying, now everybody's starting to roll in at about the same time, and about 10 officers are responding to the bar and grill immediately thereafter. You got the first folks, and then people are just showing up from the police department and other locations. And that particular uh, call for service for the Maine State Police through Department of Public Safety dispatches. We got that second call at uh, 7.10, about two minutes later than the Lewiston Center received it. 
and we had officers responding and arriving three minutes later. So why is that? They're already flying to the first address, and now we got a second call, and now they're diverting to that second call. So it's obviously going to, they're in town, uh, and they're running hard to that location. So those are the arrival times um, that I was asked about earlier today. I think based on uh, the list that I made this morning, I think that's all we had for information. Um, and I'll just call that kind of updates and follow-ups, things that uh, I knew you were asking. There were some additional questions from the general public, um, which has been good for us to receive those through these, right? They get a chance to see stuff and then they reach out and say, what does this mean? We had a, a bunch of people reach out about that shelter in place and what does that mean and what should I do and what does that look like? Um, and rather than answer those uh, through conversations with city staff, city leadership, um, police chiefs, we decided to rescind that order again. Um, but recommend that people remain vigilant as they move forward. So I do appreciate them reaching out and uh, all of that contact has something to do with our ultimate decision. You know, where do we go from here? So with that in mind, um, that's the information that I was asked uh, and, and the information that I can update. Uh, we do have, I believe, the suspect picture up here as, a, as, another, uh, as another piece. And the reason that we did this is because it's been quite some time. We've seen that photo and you have a bunch of different photos. This in fact has more of the physical description of his height and weight um, and his more official hair and eye color. Um, you could guess at that based on some of the photos that you see, but why do that if we can directly uh, give you that information? So if you could freshen up any uh, material that you have there, uh, it, it does again show that brown hooded sweatshirt and dark colored cargo pants that are in the photo that we had released earlier, which showed him walking in uh, to spare time uh, with that firearm. So I think that's the information that I wanted to, to get out to you today. I appreciate you coming back or holding on. I know you, you have long days and long nights. Um, so that piece, uh, you were going to be around anyway, I'm sure. But I am, again, happy to try to take some questions and answers. Uh, the chief is here as well. Uh, but we did want to keep this tight as an, from an operational standpoint. So, so yes, sir. Yeah, sure. So officers are required to, to qualify a certain number of times a year, right? So in this particular instance, uh, the officers are in plain clothes. They're shooting at a range right around the corner. The call comes in, they hear that, and they're going to respond, which just speaks to when these things happen, everybody's going. You could be a detective, the chief's bailing out of the station, you could be wherever. Everybody goes. So being Lewiston officers, they go, That's, we know where that is. Everybody gets in the car and they immediately go uh, to spare time, to, to help in any way they can, not knowing that in fact they're going to be the closest there and the first out. So that cuts almost two and a half minutes off the original or the initial uh, uniform police officer's response. And that's not uncommon from a police standpoint. Sometimes you got months where you're thinking, boy, I'm right around the corner when all this stuff happens. And sometimes there's, I'm on the other side of the city when other stuff happens. We're very, very lucky that the officers were that close because I think you save lives with time responses. Um, and in an urban atmosphere, depending on where everybody is and how busy the night is, um, that response could have been much longer than that. Sir, yes, sir. Have there been any credible sightings of the suspect by either law enforcement or the public since the shooting took place? Yeah, so we have, again, uh, 530 plus uh, tips and leads that have come in. Um, some of those have been sighting, some of those have been, um, it, and I would say as simple as, but hey, I've got a, a vacant house that's in this location. I own a barn that I'm afraid to go to. Uh, there's something over here that concerns me. So those things run the gamut. Um, and I'm also going to use that opportunity to that the FBI supervisory agent in charge, uh, Jody Cohen, who has been uh, with us during these press conferences. We gave that digital video information out this morning. There's already well over 100 entries in that system. So that means you're putting that information out and the general public is grabbing hold of that, wanting to be involved and sending that information in. Uh, so I thank you for that. And we certainly thank the FBI for their assistance with that kind of material. So we've got all kinds of, if somebody may say, somebody. Has law enforcement seen him in the last two days? Uh, we have not. Uh, law enforcement has not seen him in the last uh, two days. Uh, but again, in that stack of that 500 plus, you may have somebody that says, hey, we see somebody that looks like that. Um, so we have not, but go ahead, ma'am. I, 
Yeah, I cannot, and I'm not going to speak to the to the note itself. Uh, I acknowledge the fact that a note existed this morning, but I'm not going to get into exactly what it contained. But, sir. Sure. When I say address the threat, they're going in the door uh, addressing an active shooter. So they're going in uh, prepared to do whatever they need to do uh, to make that scene safe. On that particular time, the suspect is no longer there. They're going in as if they were. So the first thing you do is you go in and clear that uh, location, make sure it's safe, and then you start working with victims and triaging people and trying to make sure that you're getting additional units uh, there as fast as possible. So, yes, sir. Yeah, sure. So uh, the suspect was not at the second location when the officers arrived. Um, as we discussed this morning, we showed those three maps as specific areas we, we knew we were definitely going to be working in. Uh, and then we've also cleared other, other areas that are farther afield. Somebody may again say, you know, there's a barn over there, there's an outbuilding over there, um, there's some family property that somebody's uncle owns, and can you check that? So as those things come in, some of those are kind of on the checklist to begin with, and then some come in real time. Because as those leads come in, we do look at those and then we farm them back out to either tactical units that are looking on that apprehension side or investigative units that can go out and do additional interviews. Well, at this point, uh, you know, we are cognizant of all possibilities. Uh, we're not closing off anything um, because we want to make sure that we're being uh, as comprehensive as we can with these particular searches. Yes, ma'am? In what town? Uh, Durham. Durham. Okay. Yeah. So, I, and uh, that's a that's a situation where uh, we did. I heard that on the radio. Somebody had reached out to say that they may somebody may ask that question today. So we did look at that. There was a location there um, on a on a street in Durham uh, where there were two 911 hang up calls. 911 hang up calls happen on a regular basis. Depending on where they are, you may go. Okay, wait a second. And then we had a second call. And then there was a sheriff's deputy that responded to the scene and then ultimately did not answer their radio, right? So you go 911 hang up, 911 hang up, okay, wait a second, the officer that responded is not talking. That could be for a lot of different reasons. Again, based on the circumstances, we're certainly concerned about something like that. So officers did respond, make sure uh, that he was safe, the scene was safe, and they moved on. So there was no uh, direct connection to the suspect in this scenario, um, at least in today's call for service. Yes, sir. There's still a lot of work to be done around the search warrant side of the house just based on workload alone. I don't know, however, you know, have we searched every house that he's had over the last amount of time? Certainly the ones that most recent. Um, there's a Bowdoin connection, which uh, caused a bit of a stir last night. That was a location we were concerned about. You know, our reality from a uh, homicide investigation, as an example, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you may have done one or two search warrants. Based on electronic devices and everything else, you could do up to 30 search warrants on one. So this kind of situation, clearly there's going to be a lot of affidavits, a lot of work to be done uh, around that. Um, so we're working with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Attorney General's Office, federal entities are assisting with these warrants. Um, that's an all hands on deck. You just never know, well, I'm going to open this device and that's going to be, that's going to be the one, right? So we farmed that out to make sure we're making as much progress as possible. And I'm sorry for waiting. Go ahead. Yeah, of course. Um, by the end of this weekend, everything's just supposed to flood in the area. Mm -hmm. How is that going to complicate the search or are you hoping that it actually might help investigators and be a problem for your suspects? Yeah, so I think that that goes in two different directions, right? We certainly have a lot of resources coming for the river tomorrow because it would be nicer if it's sunnier, you can get a better, uh, better look into the water. Um, so that's one angle. 
if it's colder, there's, a, a, there's an argument to be made that um, your thermo uh, style of equipment where you're looking for body temperatures or heat signatures may work better in that scenario. Um, so it does definitely vary. If it's cold for the suspect, it's certainly cold for our officers as well and all those different things. Uh, we're certainly prepared and, and willing to do all those things, but, um, but that's where we're at. So yes, sir. Some of the reasoning behind why you removed the shelter in place orders in these four towns where you acknowledged you're still actively searching. And secondly, do we know how many weapons Card had or has in his possession? The, the second question is no, I don't know uh, how many uh, he has or had. Um, if there are weapons within that residence, that'll be part of the search warrant and counting those things out. Um, and the, the decision to release that or rescind that uh, shelter in place order is something that we've discussed uh, internally as uh, command staff members at the CP and saying, okay, we're looking at pros and cons, right? We've got communities that are locked down, that are shut down. Um, there are families and schools and pharmacies and all those things. So we knew going in and have acknowledged that repeatedly that we know that that can have a negative impact on people. So the other side of that is we had very pointed threats early on reference to these locations and nothing specific since then. So you have to look at that and you have to do the math on that and say, so are we more comfortable? Are we doing more harm than good? by keeping people away from these clinics and their doctors and in schools. And while this is still a, absolutely a dangerous situation without question, um, we've got to make recommendations and ask the people that we serve, ask the people that we protect to be vigilant, to pay attention, to listen to what we have to say. If you see something, say something. Because you know in most cases, you're like, I don't like that, that looks strange. We, we can feel that. Uh, especially when you live in neighborhoods, right? You, that you live there, you, you're comfortable with that. That deal, that car is wrong coming down my driveway at this particular time of the day. What is going on? So um, th that we don't come to those decisions to go into the order or come out lightly uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But we do appreciate all the input from everybody uh, about what does that mean and how it's impacted me as a person, right? So I appreciate that.